But you know, happy, we, we have happy greetings, like happy New Year's, happy birthday, happy Easter. And my goal this morning is that you would leave here actually happy, blissful, joyful, content, lighthearted. The issue is, can we live happy and die happy? And this morning, I want to talk about that from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. My name is David Pinckney. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's a privilege to to uh, just spend a few minutes talking about uh, how the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the means by which you can live happy and die happy. Happiness is a big deal. I mean, if, if you're an American citizen, most of you are, not all of you, but most of you, like it's written right into our Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I want to take a few moments and try to persuade you, those who are following Christ, that though life is filled with difficulties and struggles, you have every reason to be joyful, every reason to be happy. And I'm using those words interchangeably. And if you're not in Christ, I know if you're human, you're desiring happiness. And I want to make a really good case that the resurrected Christ is your best bet for happiness here in this life and happiness and death in the life to come. So as we consider this, um, again, the, the big thought that I want to kind of persuade you is that because Jesus lives, because of his resurrection, we can live and die happy. By the way, we don't like to talk about dying happy. We avoid death like uh, we should because it's like not, there's no upside to death. I mean, perhaps the ending of temporary pain here, but I've been around a lot of death, not as much as some of you EMTs and things, but been around a lot of death and there's no upside to it apart from the resurrection of Christ. You've heard the resurrection account. We sang, uh, one of the things we try to do is sing gospel songs. We, we sing about the crucifixion of Christ, which I'll touch on in a moment, and his burial and his resurrection. We are, we are small c Orthodox Christians. We believe in the Orthodox creeds of the faith that God, the eternal God, created the heavens and earth and that he sent his son to show his love and to pay for our guilt and, and to, to take our judgment and, and take that in death. But then to kill our last enemy, which was death itself, and being raised from the dead, offers to all who repent and believe new life, which he gives a deposit through his Holy Spirit and gives for eternity. That's sort of a wrap-up of the small, I say small or O Orthodox Church, because there's a big O Orthodox Church, and they, wear, they have cool robes and spices and smoke and big beards and hats and cool names. But... Uh, we're not big O, we're small O. With that, let me, um, what we're going to look at from this text, from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and we'll have the verses on, um, on the screen. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to get one into your hands. I understand for some of you, like, you're here because someone twisted your arm, and I want to honor that. And considering Christianity, especially in a post-Christian era in our, our culture, is a huge thing. So I want to honor the fact that you, for you even to consider being here is a big step, and, and thank you. And to consider the claims of Christ might take some time. But as we open a book that we believe, if God can make this world and save us, he can certainly write a book through 40 authors over 100, uh, 1,500 years and get it right, the story right. Peter was one of the apostles, and he writes a letter. And uh, I'm, in the text we're looking at, there are four arguments for why happiness is rooted in believing in Jesus. And it is a ex experienced happiness now. It's an, it's an um, anticipated happiness. It's an enduring happiness. And it's, there's the person of happiness. So that's what we'll look at. I want to talk about experienced happiness. Right now, in this moment, despite the circumstances, if you are in Christ because he is risen as a Christian, you have every reason to be joyful. Doesn't mean life's going well. Doesn't mean the finances are all in good shape. Doesn't mean all your earthly desires are, are good. But because of the risen Christ, 
you who are in Christ have every reason to be happy and to experience it some measure. The text this morning, and we'll put it up there, verses, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, um, chapter 1, verse 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3, I'll put it up on the screen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, this is all based upon Christ being raised from the dead. Yet, and, and, you know, we'll end with this. Like, I haven't seen Jesus. I'm believing the testimony of the 500 who did. Uh, and and that's, that's changed the world. But based upon the resurrection of, of God's son, those who look to him as their savior, and savior, I remember one of my first jobs between my freshman and uh, sophomore year of college, I was working over at the Hopkinton Dam. It was my dam job. Yeah, I can get away with it only in that context. And I was talking to guys I was working with uh, about, about following Christ. And I used that term like, he saved me. And they said, what does that mean? It means he rescues us from our guilt and from death. Well, this idea of God giving us a new birth, and, and Jesus coined a term. He called, he, he, Jesus used the term, you've got to be born again. In other words, you have to have a new birth. I've had four uh, friends or relatives give birth in the last two weeks to little baby Fern, little baby River, little baby Roman, and little baby Daniel. <laughs> like, like, those are quite the names. I'm Daniel like normal, except he's Daniel the fifth. Um, <laughs> seriously. Uh, but each of those children experience a new life, and everything's new in there as they, as they start to gain awareness, their eyes and their ears are taking in the new surroundings. Well, Jesus says that is much like it happens when, when we turn from our own self-reliant ways and, and rest in who he is and what he's done. When we believe in him, a new birth, a new life, we have a new awareness. We see things differently. We hear things differently. We're, we're aware now. This experienced happiness is, is an unending awe. It starts in that verse, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are people to take in and be in awe of things, whether it be spring flowers or majestic mountains or crashing waves. We are hungry to be in awe. In fact, one of the failures of the modern self-amazement theories like you are your own identity, is that you run out of oddness of yourself. I mean, you are awesome with a small a, but you're not an awesome awesome. Like, you're just one of eight billion people. And you have incredible abilities, you really do. And you can make astounding contributions to community and culture. But as one of eight billion people, and you've got a range of like 80 years. And you can do everything to try to be remembered. But like, it, you won't be well remembered. I'm sorry. Like, two miles from here, the 14th president is buried. Most of you didn't know that. The 14th president of the United States is buried. Like, I can look out my backyard and see his tombstone. No big deal. You are awesome, but you're not awesome. So what, where do we go to fill this, this desire for awesomeness? We have this hunger for eternity. What is there to cause you to be in constant awe? Nobody stands on the rim of the Grand Canyon and looks and goes, I am awesome. <laughs> and no one who becomes aware of a God who breathed the galaxies into existence before breakfast one morning. No one stands in his presence and says, I am awesome. Yes, you are awesome with a small a because you're made in the image of God. You're remarkable. You have contributions to make. But you're not eternally awesome. And to experience happiness, we need to be people who are, see God as the blessed one. The one that we can always turn to and go, wow, wow. 
This experienced happiness is not just an unending awe, but that verse goes on. Uh, it says, blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy. The word mercy is basically we were in trouble and someone had to rescue us. We had dug ourselves in a hole. We had a debt. We had got, we got arrested and needed someone to bail us out. And God's great mercy is he offers to take our sin debt. We don't like to talk about that. It's not, a, it's not, it's not culturally acceptable to talk about sin. Sin is a, a, a religious um, structure, construct. But in reality, where does shame and guilt come from? When somebody does bad things to you, is that not sin? And as good as you are, I suspect you've done good, bad things to other people. But this is the good news, that Christ has come in his great mercy. See, we're not just people of Easter morning, resurrected, Resurrection Sunday. We are people of Good Friday. We gathered here on, on Friday to remember that it was Christ who took our criminal penalty so that we could have his innocence. It was the great exchange that Jesus took the judgment of God upon him. And this is the great offering of the gospel. God comes into the world and says, I love you. I'll pay off your sin debt. You need to turn from whatever you're relying on and turn to me. Trust in what my son has done and receive that freely. Listen, religion is about trying to get to heaven because you're good. That is not Christianity. At the heart, Christianity is saying, I can't get to heaven because I'm not good. But Christ, the good one, has come and taken my guilt and made the way so that I can go. This is experienced happiness and mercy. And that means when David Pinckney sins, and I do, just ask Sharon, ask my kids, ask the elders. I mean, I'm a sinner. The mercy of Christ has paid for my sins. And if we're trying to be good, it's because we want to be like our Heavenly Father. If we're trying to be more gentle and kind, it's because we want to be like our Savior. We, we really do want to make a positive contribution to, to this world by being children of God. This experience... Happiness is also in hope. Because as that verse ended, it says that we uh, have this living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I said that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can live happy and die happy. And regardless of what you do, you're not going to dodge that death thing. I mean, it's just not happening. It, it still has a high success rate. And this leads us, though, to an anticipated happiness. Verses 4 and 5 talk about a future happiness. I was reading this week in The Atlantic um, an article by Marina Koran about Elon Musk. He's the inventor of Tesla and SpaceX and, and tried, is trying to buy bit, uh, Twitter for a measly $43 billion. Anyway, she writes this. Um, Marina writes this. Elon Musk when he wants to be, can be quite philosophical. As in February, when he gave a long speech about his vision for the future from his growing SpaceX spaceport in South Texas, he said it is very important, essential, that over the long term, we become a multi-planet species and ultimately even go beyond our solar system and bring life with us. Standing in front of a prototype of a giant gleaming rocket meant to one day travel to the moon and Mars, he said, the creatures that we love can't build spaceships, but we can, and we can bring them with us. And the thought of turning science fiction into reality, Musk loves it. That's what fires me up the most. Let's go out there and find out what this universe is all about, he says. How did we get here? What is the meaning of life? Is that enough to anticipate? And I applaud Musk. I mean, I wish I had a Tesla. I mean, I, like, like, it's like, he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty inspiring. But is that, is that where we find life? Is the meaning of life somewhere out there that we have to go find? Or has it come to us? The verse in verses uh, four and five says, and into an inheritance. So what he's saying here, he's given us a new birth into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, 
and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. I don't know if we have any trust fund kids here, you know, living off of mom and dad's wealth. And if you are, I applaud you, and that's an awesome place to be. Most of us aren't. But in Christ, we have an inheritance that is imperishable. It can't be taken away. It can't be defiled. Listen, for a billion Christians on the planet, we'd like to suggest to Mr. Musk and others who are looking for meaning out there that with all your inventions and explorations which we applaud, the meaning of life has come to us. The one who caused us to be has spoken. He has created us for his pleasure and ours. And those in Christ can anticipate a happiness of an inheritance, not earned or discovered, but given freely. And you know your desire, my desire for ease and comfort and security? That's all woven into your DNA because you're made in the image of God. You were meant to be secure. You were meant to be content. You were meant, you were built for freedom. But a rebellion against God has, has made us those who are seeking it in places that cannot satisfy. I think our creator made us to find an unending satisfaction in him and with him, which is why Christ has come, that our joy, our happiness might be full. And it's secure. It's guarded, as the text says. This world is not secure. Mariupol, Ukraine, had been a very, very busy port city with beaches. But today, it's rubble. So much of human achievement ends that way. And you and I, we will lose everything in this world. Our eyesight and our hearing, our mobility, and perhaps our minds, maybe our family, and finally we'll lose our life. It's all like that flower we are singing about that will fade. But we who are in Christ, because of the resurrection, have an unfading, imperishable inheritance in a paradise that Jesus has prepared for his followers, even like the thief on the cross who cried out to Jesus in his last breath and said, remember me today in your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's an anticipated happiness that will be revealed. My wife and I are in a book club and we read novels or books every month with a group of people from well, you, we all used to be in Chichester, but we've sort of scattered. Um, but a, a novelist will build your anticipation for the outcome. This is how Christians read the Bible. We read it and get to Revelation 21, and we go, this ends really well. We've talked about this experienced happiness and anticipated happiness, but we need to talk about an enduring happiness because life doesn't go well even for those who are in Christ. What does it mean to have enduring happiness? You see, if your source of happiness can't hold up in trouble, then what, what good is it? When loneliness overwhelms you, when friends betray you and let you down, when the diagnosis isn't great, when life is hard and we feel more dark days than light days, what will help you endure? We get a taste of this. We get a taste of this. We get a taste of it in life. Like, like there, there are seasons of trouble. I mentioned the four little babies that are born into friends or family of mine. And, and you know, the last, the last half a month is not necessarily comfortable from what I understand from uh, women who are carrying babies and then labor. But the happiness does come and enables you to endure. For those who garden, there's much tilling and much sowing and much weeding, much watering to endure for a harvest. 
Well, those who are in Christ, we will endure difficulty as we wait for the harvest, as we wait for the ultimate experience of new life. It says in uh, verses 6 and 7, put those up on the screen. You rejoice in this. No, that would be the next one. Yeah, there we go. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're considering Christianity, and I hope you are, I hope you're considering Jesus as the ultimate source of happiness, I can't guarantee you that following Christ will be easier. I can just guarantee you it will be happier. That it will, you will have an enduring happiness that will see you through life's troubles. Our church is filled with troubles. People overcoming addiction, people who have critical health issues, people whose marriages have failed, people who have a hard time getting um, sustainable work. But in Christ, there is an enduring happiness. Even, it says, rejoice in, it says, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief. I've been pastoring now, it's coming up on 35 years. I've done a ton of funerals. I love to do the funerals of people who know Jesus. It is a huge privilege. I prefer to do that than a wedding. Not that I won't do your wedding, I do your wedding. But like, like, there's something about a saint who dies in the Lord, and you know, you know that they have endured with joy to the very end. We suffer, but we do it believing that God is at work and through it, good will come. Recently, I was on a trip from Mexico City down to Bogota, Colombia. It's a four hour flight. And I finally, finally got the nerve to watch Hacksaw Ridge. If you haven't seen it, I don't know if you should watch it or not. It's a true story about Desmond Doss who was a pacifist um, in the World War II, who served as a combat medic. Inspired by his faith in Christ, he wouldn't pick up a gun, partially because of an angry outbreak he had with his father and almost shot his dad, but primarily because of his faith. But in the midst of battle, and there's this true story, Battle of Hacksaw Ridge, uh, he rescued 75 wounded soldiers. It's, it's worth a watch. I just... It's, you won't be eating popcorn. Um, a true story. And, and there was such joy both in those who were rescued and ultimately in Desmond, even though in, the last, in, the, in the, his last um, uh, rescue attempt, he was um, wounded quite severely. But uh, in the midst of it, it's kind of a reminder of what it means to follow Christ. We are in a world that is just filled with... with, with pain and anguish but we do have an enduring happiness that keeps us motivated knowing the joy that is ahead and for those of us in this as christians for the people who are being rescued this kind of leads us to well where does all this happiness lie and it lies in not a church not in a religion but in a person the person of happiness if I ask you this, who makes you the most happy? Or who do you think would make you the most happy? Some of you might go, well, we're married and we hope to have kids and that will bring us happiness. And, and as a father of five, I can say children are an immense source of happiness. But eternal, enduring, unending happiness? No. And no child should have to bear the weight of trying to live up to their parents' source of ultimate happiness. It's just child abuse, really. For those who might be single, you go, well, I will be happy when I find that soulmate, that companion, that partnership. And a spouse can bring great happiness, but enduring, unending happiness? No. Let's look at the closing text, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, that's Jesus, you love him. So this is Christians, okay? We have not seen Jesus, but we love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice in, with inexpressible and glorious joy, 
because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I haven't met President Zelensky, but I am really inspired by him. I've read about him. I've heard him. In fact, yesterday he left a 30-second little, he, he's just, he, he, I don't know, he, he left a 30-second little encouragement uh, video, and it says, good evening, 52 days. What can I say? We are strong. We work, and he, sh- he holds up some paperwork he's working on. We love, he takes his, his iPhone and, and shows a picture of his, his wife and two kids. We are thankful, he shows a porcelain rooster, which has some history to it. We are proud, he shows a flag, and we will defeat our enemies. And he's inspiring. I have met him. I believe that he's real. I mean, I don't think that's all fake. More than President Zelensky. I have not met, I've not seen Jesus. I've experienced Jesus. He's changed my soul inside. There's been a new birth. When I came to Jesus as a little guy, the weight of sin that was lifted, I can still feel that. He has kept me. But I have not seen Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. We are loving a Christ we have not seen as our source of ultimate happiness. His death and resurrection is what we who are in him stake our lives on, our forgiveness and our hope. Let me make it clear again. If you're considering Christianity, it's not about being good. It's about being forgiven and living a new life in him. I seek to be good because I want to be like my father. I hate what sin does through me. I hate the sinner I see in the mirror. But Christ enables us to see life in a whole different way. See our lives as ones of giving, not receiving. Seeing our lives as as temporary here, but eternal. A source of inexpressible and glorious joy. This man, Jesus. And for those of you in Christ, let me just urge you, the closer you walk with Jesus, the more you read about him and watch his videos, so to speak. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, I guess the chosen is pretty good. Uh, it's not authentic. It's just good. Uh, but, but Jesus, right? Like the more you walk with Jesus, the happier you'll be. I have the, the happiest Christians I know are the ones who practice the disciplines. Let me just urge you, those of you in Christ, keep forcing yourself to do the disciplines. Be in, hear his word. Talk to him. Serve. Make gathering a, a priority. Those who are the happiest in Jesus are the ones who practice the disciplines. And for those of you who are, are um, here considering Christianity or just you're hearing about it and saying, I'm still not sure, let me want to close with these four questions. These are sort of application questions from the text we were looking at. One, are you happy? I mean, I want you to be happy. Are you happy? And that's, 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 a, that's a legitimate question. Like, where are you going for... And the second question is about who are you basing your happiness in? Like, I hope you get a great spouse. I hope you have a, you know, a bushel of kids. You know, I, I mean, I, I hope all that happens. But is that your happiness? Who is your happiness? Will your basis for happiness endure difficulty? That's, that's a really test. That's a, that's a like, if you're basing your, your, uh, your, your happiness on, say, your health, and you get that diagnosis that you never saw coming, or that that accident that happens uh, randomly in in an automobile and and you're you're, you're crippled. God forbid that happens, but difficulty happens. Will your basis for happiness endure difficulty? And finally, will your desire for eternal happiness be satisfied? I have not met a human being who does not have an insatiable desire for happiness. And we anticipate happiness like going to Disneyland. That's a wonderful thing. Or Disney World. Or like I'm taking my wife. I've got enough frequent flyer miles. I'm going to take her in, uh, in July to Ireland. Like we're anticipating that. But, you know, the trip ends and we have to come home and pay up the bills that we realized, oh, we spent that much money? Like, you know what it's like. Like 
what is, how, will your desire for eternal happiness, how will that be satisfied? And I, I can just urge you to consider Jesus. I believe he is the source of all joy, all contentment, all bliss. You were made for him. And that, he, in him, you will find your great happiness. Let me pray. Lord, it's been a good gathering. We've sung. We've considered a text of scripture. We believe that you're at work in this room. Those of us in Christ, Lord, we believe that you're here. We ask that you would finish works in us that we can ourselves. For your saints, Lord, strengthen them in their calling to live out a life in you. Lord, give us greater joy as we pursue the disciplines of of being close to you, of drinking deeply of your presence, of of hearing your word and, and being with your people. And Lord, for friends and family who are here, and Lord, uh, the, the claims of Christ and who you are are still something that uh, they haven't fully believed. I pray, Lord, that today would answer some questions, perhaps cause them some curiosity, or even today give them enough to believe that you are the eternal Son of God for whom all things were made and by whom all things have life and in whom we have forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. Lord, may that be true. In Christ's name, amen.